How did we get to cat eye surgery and buckle fat removal surgery? What are the origins of the cosmetic and reconstructive plastic surgeries that are available today? How are we now able to recreate facial features that have been lost through trauma or disease? The most ancient information that we have on the history of plastic surgery is the Edwin Smith's Papyrus, written sometime between 2600 and 2200 BC. It describes 48 surgical cases. It states that the Egyptians used strips of linen cloth made adherent by the application of gum to close margins of linear wounds. Bandages and silk thread sutures were used regularly. If the stitching of the wound was loose and a risk of infection or the breakdown of the tissue existed, they would treat it with grease and honey every day until the patient recovered. They also used powdered marble mixed with vinegar as a local anesthetic. Meanwhile, in India, 6th century BC, rhinoplasty or nasal surgery arose from more sinister beginnings. The nose, as a symbol of pride, would be cut off to marginalize people who were thought to deserve it. It was mostly performed on adulterers, thieves, and other criminals. In northern India, a low priest class, the kumas or potters, developed techniques for replacing the skin of the nose that had been cut off. Shushruta, a member of this potter class, described the method of transferring skin from the forehead and from the cheek to the nose using personalized surgical instruments. These were likely the first instruments used for nasal reconstruction. Shushruta described this technique in his text called Samhita. When a man's nose has been cut off or destroyed, the physician takes the leaf of a plant, he places it on the patient's cheek, and cuts out his and cuts out of this cheek a piece of skin of the same size in such a manner that the skin at one end remains attached to the cheek. Then he freshens with his scalpel the edges of the stump of the nose and wraps the piece of skin from the cheek carefully around it and sews it at all edges. As soon as the skin has been sewn together with the nose, he cuts through the connection with the cheek. Later on, this approach was named the Indian method. Shushruta is considered the father and originator of plastic surgery. He has described various reconstructive procedures for different types of defects. He also induced anesthesia using wine and henbane, which were used in his numerous cases of rhinoplasty and otoplasty. The first report of an otoplasty appears in the Samhita, the so-called Indian Advancement Flap. Moving to China in 390 BC, they documented the first cleft lip surgery. The surgery was performed on an 18-year-old soldier, Wei Yang Chi. The surgeon who performed the procedure warned the patient that after cutting and sewing the edges together, the part must remain in absolute rest for 100 days. Wei agreed without hesitation and lived as a guest of the governor for more than three months, eating only gruel and neither speaking nor laughing. The result of the operation was considered successful. Fast forward to ancient Rome where Celsus lived from 25 BC to 50 AD. He was an encyclopedist who was also known for his medical work. He performed cutaneous flaps similar to Shushruta. Besides nasal reconstruction, he also successfully repaired lips and ears after trauma. But Celsus introduced one important improvement to the procedure, recommending the use of an outline of a geometric shape, preferably quadrangular or triangular, so that it could be more easily covered by a matching flap. In 10th century Spain, Albucasas and his fellow surgeons came up with improved ways to control bleeding during surgery. They used hot metals like gold to stop bleeding. Since hot metal could injure the delicate tissue of the child's lip, they eventually resorted to a different technique. This involved making a tiny incision in the lip, inserting a clove of garlic, and leaving it in place for 15 hours. After removing the garlic, the edges of the defect were dressed with a bandage moistened with butter. Further development of plastic surgery was delayed by the fall of Rome in the 5th century and the expansion of barbarian tribes and Christianity during the Middle Ages. Pope Innocent III even prohibited surgery in the 13th century. The standstill in the field of surgery was broken by the Renaissance in the 14th century, which saw a revival of science and medicine. During the 15th century in Italy, the Branca family, father and son, performed numerous ear and nose surgeries. The father, like Shushruta, used flaps from the face, but the son, Antonio, motivated by the desire to limit scarring, tried using a skin flap from the arm. The head was connected to the arm for several weeks, 
until he gradually cut away the connection and shaped the new skin into a nose. Later on in the 16th century, Tagliacozzi presented the Italian method. He said, an incision is made in the skin of one of the arms, right or left, down to the flesh, right down to the surface of the muscle. In other words, simple and solid skin is taken from the anterior brachial region. But when one observes a good union of the wound and a good nourishment of the skin, then one may cut the arm from the face. In 16th century France, Pierre Franco made an important contribution to cleft lip surgery. He used dry sutures, pins, and triangular bandages. He recommended that the cheeks should be mobilized in the repair and did not hesitate to adjust the premaxilla. He was later known as the father of lip repairs. By the end of the 18th century, the practice of rhinoplasty began to spread across Europe. In 1794, a magazine called Gentleman's Magazine presented the story of a British soldier who lost his nose in war. He later had his nose replaced by a flap of skin brought down from the forehead. In 19th century Germany, James Israel started using free autologous bone from the tibia or shin bone to reconstruct saddle nose deformities in patients with syphilis and lupus. Other surgeons created free skin grafts using skin from the postauricular area and even better results were made possible by experimenting with cartilage and bone graft. In 1844, Merault, a French surgeon, further advanced cleft lip surgery. He introduced a triangular flap from the lateral side placed into a gap created by making a horizontal incision on the medial side. This broke up the linear scar and introduced additional tissue in an attempt to lengthen the lip. In 1893, Vincent Zerny performed the first documented breast augmentation surgery. He operated on a 41-year-old singer who had a tumor removed from her left breast. He found another apple-sized fatty tumor, a lipoma, in her back, removed it and inserted the lipoma into her breast. In 1896, Joseph, a German surgeon, was confronted with a young boy who was afraid of going to school because he was being mocked by his classmates for protruding ears. Joseph helped the boy by doing the following. From the upper half of the oracle, I removed a wedge-shaped piece on both sides together with the corresponding cartilage, cutting through the helix, the scaphoid fossa, the anti-helix, deep down into the concha at an angle of 50 to 60 degrees. Then came the joining of the free wound edges. In 1897, a group of 34 Belgian musicians ate smoked ham and developed visual and gastrointestinal symptoms. Three of the 34 died. The remaining ham and some of the deceased organs were sent to a bacteriology professor. He found a strain of bacteria that was the causative agent and named it Bacillus botulinum after the Latin word of botulus for sausage. Later, it was established that the basic mechanism of these bacteria is muscle paralysis. This was the precursor to cosmetic Botox. In 1901, surgeon von Hollander performed the first facelift on a Polish aristocrat. He is considered to be one of the pioneers of facelifting. He excised 5 cm long strips of skin which curved along the hairline and the natural folds of the face so that the scarring was less visible. He sutured without undermining, simply inserting oblique stitches to lift the skin laterally. In World War I, 1914 to 1918, the demand for plastic surgery increased dramatically. On the front lines, treating facial injuries was challenging. There were instances, for example, when surgeons repaired a laceration without accounting for the amount of overall tissue loss. As the scars healed, natural form and function were negatively impacted. In 1915, surgeon Harold Gillies saw a spike in the number of horrifying facial injuries. By 1916, Gillies had persuaded his medical administrators that a hospital specifically for facial injuries was urgently needed. He founded the Queen's Hospital in 1917. The facility was the first of its kind to treat facial injuries. The Queen's Hospital's mission was to restore the faces of injured men as completely as possible so that they could return to their regular lives. In World War II, 1939 to 1945, there were four renowned plastic surgeons who established plastic surgery as a field of study. Gillies, McIndoe, Kilner, and Malin. 
The centers they worked in attracted many surgeons from around the world who wanted to master the craft of reconstructive surgery. The quick expansion of specialized interest resulted in advancements in burn treatments, wound healing, transplant immunology, and the development of microsurgical tools and techniques. During the first half of the 20th century, liquid paraffin injections were used as a form of breast augmentation around the world. Other early injectables included Vaseline, olive oil, white wax, and glycerin. Unfortunately, even with initial good results, secondary or late severe complications appeared due to the dispersion of paraffin. There was the formation of nodules called paraffinomas that were very difficult to remove. In the 1960s, Giro and Cronin helped engineer the first silicone breast implant, and later on, saline breast implants entered the field. In 1969, Skoog in Sweden introduced a new facelift concept. He suggested that manipulating and suspending the deeper layers underneath the skin provided more desirable results compared to traditional methods. Since then, there have been many other advancements in cosmetic and reconstructive plastic surgery. Today, free tissue transfer, face transplants, limb salvage, tummy tucks, rhinoplasty, and FUE hair transplants, among many other procedures, are performed regularly around the world. I remain humbled by the incredible discoveries of the past and by my many colleagues who continue to push the field forward today.